again, for those who have been here, um, or rather have come to our conversations, more than uh, just this time, this might be a little bit of a repeat for you, but for those who it's their first time, I'm going to say, Welcome, hello, I'm Abby Lee. I'm the Audience Engagement Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor. So happy to have you joining us tonight for In Conversation and Repeat, which is featuring artists from the 2021 Windsor-Essex Triennial of Contemporary Art. So the Windsor-Essex Triennial of Contemporary Art, it's the AGW's signature group artist exhibition focusing on contemporary art practice in southwestern Ontario, Windsor, Essex, and Detroit. And before we get into, uh, well, rather before I, I pass the figurative mic over to our curators, um, I'd like to say the land acknowledgement, which again is really important to hear and, and take in and keep with us, not only for tonight, but also as we go forth um, long after this event as well. So while this conversation and recording is happening digitally, today I want to acknowledge that I am physically situated on Anishinaabe territory, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. I want to state my respect of the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. Okay, so again, some of you may be familiar with this already, but for those who are new, I'm going to go into a little bit about the theme for our triennial this year. So for 2021, the Windsor-Essex Triennial of Contemporary Art is focusing on the theme of conversations. So interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, we at the AGW were forced to rethink and reconsider how we could continue having critical conversations that matter to our community. Despite this uncertainty, however, art practices continued getting richer and more varied as artists ad adapted to keep critical conversation alive in an unprecedented time. As such, the Windsor-Essex Triennial of Contemporary Art set out as a starting point to see what artists in Windsor-Essex and beyond were in conversation about and why. So tonight we're going to be diving into our second conversation with our curators, Ray Cronin and Lucas Cabral and artists Serena Mendoza, Sharmis Bakar and Paul Dignan. So I'm going to introduce Ray and Lucas, and then I'll hand it over to Lucas, who uh, will be our facilitator for tonight's conversation. So Ray Cronin is a Nova Scotia-based writer, curator, and editor. He is the author of nine books, including John Greer, Hard Thought, and Maud Lewis, Life and Work. And Lucas Cabral is an artist, curator, and arts administrator with a background in marketing, communications, and community engagement. Lucas completed his BFA at Western University and has since held positions in public art galleries and service organizations um, at Harborfront Center, Macintosh Gallery, the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, AIDS Committee of Durham Region, and Art Site Inc. So get all of the Zoom excitement and applause that you can and join me in welcoming our curators. I'm going to hand it over to Lucas to continue this conversation. Uh, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to see so many uh, familiar names showing up in the chat and participating. Um, thank you so much for coming and being here. And uh, I'm really excited to, of course, sorry about that. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation as we look forward to actually getting to see the triennial uh, in person, hopefully someday soon. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce each artist as part of this panel, who will speak a little bit about their work, and then we'll have an opportunity towards the end for some kind of Q&A and uh, things that kind of come up in between. So the panel and the way that we've um, gathered the artists for this panel is called And Repeat which uh, looks at the shared use of repetition to shine new light on common materials. With each act of repetition, Paul Dignan, Sharmis Thakar, and Serena Mendoza's practices demonstrate the fascinating cycle 
of work, 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 and repeat, as each new cycle lays the groundwork for increased depth and nuance within their practice. Uh, so the first artist that I have the pleasure of introducing is Zarina Mendoza. Zarina is an interdisciplinary artist whose material-based practice centers around her fascination with exportable goods, inherited cultural memory, and the mediation of transnational ties. In particular, she often returns to her upbringing in central Alberta, which deepened her explorations of the permeable sense of home, contesting reality, and the communal associations of intergenerational care. While her work is informed by fragments of childhood and her family's immigration from the Philippines, the hybrid result negotiates time and space that reflect the mobility of labor, objects, and capital within a post-colonial world. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Zarina, who will show us some images of their work and talk us through it. Just gonna make sure I unmute myself. All right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Abby, for the introduction and same to you, Lucas and Ray. Um, it's an honor to be on a panel with both Sharmista and Paul today. Um, it's been a hard year and it's just, it's kind of nice seeing this all kind of manifest in, you know, both the physical space and virtually. Um, so if we go to the next slide, cool. Uh, the next three images are going to be works that were done in my undergrad. Um, and it's going to be sort of a progression on how I became more familiar with using materials and sort of intervening these types of materials that I'm attracted to that are associated with um, migration and more exportable goods and the act of, you know, wrapping something. Um, so this was a piece called um, The Unfinished Basement, and it was a black and white photo uh, scanned in and then blown up uh, and applied to the, uh, installed on the wall uh, using packing tape. And I'm going to try my best to like talk through each of these works in like the fastest way possible because I don't want to like go through other people's time. But um, yeah. Uh, I think it was just like my first time really intervening with a material and making my own custom tape um, and, you know, just really driving home this idea of authenticity and how that plays in to tradition and culture and trying to define yourself within a space that, you know, you're born of another country of immigrant parents in a diaspora um, and trying to negotiate this, um, I guess, liminal space. Um, and exploring this through types of materials that do migrate and kind of protect types of things. Um, so that's going to be kind of a common theme that I'm returning to. And again, um, as I moved to Windsor and I was returning home um, back over the summers to central Alberta, I was just, you know, as my parents were aging and I was seeing like the environment of my childhood home changing, like there, there, there was a lot of things that I was like, trying to grasp onto and like they were becoming more and more blatantly obvious that like you know this is um an experience that probably wouldn't be the same if I lived say in Ontario within an urban space um and of a minority um yeah we'll move on to the next slide thank you um this is another piece uh, called your titas always and i wanted to show this one because this is where i started to become like a little bit more attracted to this like hype like very synthetic materials and you know like we associate like very plastic items to um things that are manufactured in china um and you know there's this idea that like i liked this feeling of something that's like super cheap but I'm being like very precious about it and um, that material that I used uh, with cellophane was like a food grade cellophane that's kind of common in these types of confectionaries in Filipino culture um, and then there's the ga the garment box um, and then I'll speak to a lot of the objects that I became like more obsessive about were these um, items that are commonly gifted within a Balak Bayan box. Um, and what a Balak Bayan box within Filipino culture is, um, I think it's like translates, yeah, it translates to repatriate. Um, so it's often these like massive corrugated boxes that are just filled with like certain items, like maybe from the country that that um, off-sea worker is living in and is 
you know, ship to that your home country, wherever that may be. Um, and again, like, because I was using such like synthetic materials, like I found myself just being like, oh, it's like too plastic. Like I need something a little bit more organic. And again, like I was thinking about, um, you know, like when my mom would return from the Philippines from a vacation, well, yeah, visiting family, um, like it would smell like either like tanduai rum, like a sweet alcoholic rum and like banana leaves. And, you know, it's, it's just like the same sort of materials that are this, I guess, like wrapping. There's, there's a way of like being resourceful about orga both organic um, goods and both exportable goods like plastic. Um, go to the next one. Thank you. Um, and then this one, again, I think I was exploring just, you know, bearing these images from home. Again, this is like a black and white image that was like blown up. Um, and then I, car I carved up. I um, punched out like the text, uh, something for when you welcome me, uh, which is a direct translation of Pasalubong, which is a very deep traditional um, way of, a gesture that's showing that like you're okay in a different country. So there's like this deep tradition of gift giving within uh, Filipino culture. Uh, and, you know, like this is this pantry. I don't know if, I know you can't really see it, but this is like um, an image of my parents like basement pantry. And there's just like multiples and multiples and multiples of things that looks like a store, a storefront essentially and it is like you know there's caesar dressing there's like adobo sauce there's just this curiosity of cuisine that's there and it was like a very rich upbringing um that i knew that you know my parents wanted to have this multicultural um curiosity and welcoming within our family um yeah we'll move on to the next one okay um yeah so this kind of idea of repetition. If we're talking about repetition, I realized that this is like a manifestation of like my cultural longing or this type of like language preservation. And that's with like repetition, like it's habitual, it's practice, it's ritual. Um, and I saw that manifest in a way of like even chores and like the importance of chores and domestic space and the way that language I understood language um, within Tagalog, like all the words that I understood were within the domestic space. Like my mom would be talking to me in Tagalog and I would respond back in English. And it's things that I understand are only within the domestic space. If we were talking about something like within another environment, I probably wouldn't really understand it. Um, so this piece call, uh, that was um, included in a group exhibition curated by Nadja Pelkey. I'm so, so grateful to be my first show that was um, exhibited in Art Site alongside uh, writer Casey Platt, um, painter Laura Madeira, and another artist, uh, Andy Carvalho. Um, yeah, super cool experience. Uh, this piece, this is where I started to kind of work sculpturally. Um, and these are towels that I received, requested from Marriott Hotel uh, down here in Windsor. And it's this folding motion that was like repeated. And I remember how my Lola or my grandmother was teaching me how to uh, fold towels. And she was such a perfectionist. And I realized at that moment, it's just like, you know, like these, my hand or my movement in using these materials are just as important in like, holding on to these just like very simple sort of traditions um and you know like just stacking it it's just i it, it's this linen closet that was like kind of chaotic um in my mom my parents house and yet i was had this like very strict regimented like upbringing of like how it should look perfect and yet it existed within such like kind of a chaotic um way <laughs> so um peppered in there are um uh, duster, uh, how do you say it? It's like, it's clothes for inside the house. It's like informal. You're just only meant to wear it on the inside. So I'm realizing more and more like my work is like from a very feminine perspective. Um, and I should mention that this piece, uh, had 
shaved pieces of like soap, kamai soap. Oh, I'm saying that in a Filipino accent. It's like a, I guess I'll say it. It's kamai soap that's like, it was perfuming. I think in like, I think it was like a 50s thing where you would like, in a linen closet, you would just like shove pieces of soap to make sure that it's like still smells fresh. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to uh, engage more senses with my work. Um, yeah, I'll move on to the next one. <laughs> this is another install shot from the same show. So I had two pieces that were featured in this exhibition placed. And um, the Mahjong table, this is where, okay, so now I'm like stepping kind of away from the wall and I'm thinking about things like sculpturally again, like being able to go um, around the piece. Uh, and the Mahjong table, uh, this piece was called Manila Ambition, uh, which is a hand that's dealt within the Mahjong uh, game that is like the most ideal uh, within the Filipino version of the game Mahjong. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's um, that game of Mahjong is dealing with movement and north, south, east, west, uh, directional ways of moving. And so I thought about commodity. I thought about, you know, exportable goods, like even labor and people that are moving. Um, and there, the text, if you go to the next slide, like, there we go. Um, I'm not sure if you could read the text, but um, I kind of I erased uh, the Chinese characters and hand painted, you know, like pineapples um, and these uh, objects or these materials that are from the tropics. Uh, the sense of erasure that happens within even talking about Asian countries um, and even the president of that time in the 1940s described Filipinos as the most occidental and the most oriental. And that's like right in the middle. I feel like that's, it was a really strange term that was almost like within an internalized bias of the Americans to describe what Filipinos are is like, you know, you're almost exploiting, you know, the very definition. And that in the sense is um, a post-colonial idea of what a race might be. Um, you know, it's, it's just like, it, it's beyond this border, right? Um, so yeah, I'll try to not, speak. It's, it's very rich in like certain references and I'll try not to like speak too much about it. But um, then I became obsessed with the stools. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so specific to um, civic engagement and this idea of like communal sense um, of gathering. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Cool, thank you. And yeah, in terms of like repetition and multiples, like I'm so drawn to the kitchen aisle. I mean, I'm already obsessed with like the Asian supermarket because like growing up in within central Alberta, um, you know, we had before like there were massive like supermarkets that, Asian supermarkets, we had to like go drive an hour just to like my mom wanting specific ingredients, right? Um, but I was so obsessed with just like seeing these things that also exist within a different world, but were also very familiar to me. Um, and so, you know, things, I don't want to speak too much about like this whole, you know, um, it's an immigrant uh, idea of like the scarcity mindset, but yes, things like things like trying to be resort you're trying to be resourceful and limit the use of things um and having the most abundant amounts of it to share and to reserve was kind of an idea that I was returning to um thank you yeah and so in that sense again I returned to the cellophane I was like, you know, like there's these confectionaries that are covered and I want to be like the most frivolous with this material. Um, and I feel like it was the way that it existed to me is just like very special. And even with the stools, like that was something that's like anchoring for me. So in this, in this work that's featured in the triennial um, called range power capacity, it's something that's anchoring like these, 
these sets of stools are something that's like important for me to know that there's a community that exists. Maybe it's not close to me, but I know it's in within range. Um, and it's this structure is um, based off a national Filipino game, um, which is called the Pabitin, which it's kind of like a Filipino version of the pinata, where like an adult is carrying a rope and it's like swung over. It's like a pulley where like it's swung over like a beam and the adult is able to bring, raise and lower this grate for children to kind of jump and grab this, uh, you know, like prizes that are um, hung from this grid. So when I was making this, you know, like I'm, I'm informed through my memory of my grandfather making it and unfortunately he passed in October. And so it's just like, it's just really strange because like that was like my one, per like my last root person that I wanted to speak to Galog to. And I was like, okay, like there's, there's a link that's like missing a little bit. Um, so yeah, like I just thought about, you know, a child trying to reach something where another adult is kind of, or an elder more so is in control of that reach. Um, and yet it, it, it's anchored. So it's like, there's this cultural wrestle I feel like that I'm trying to make sense of. Um, so this, you know, like these sculptures that I'm making are the best way that are physically like manifesting this idea of like language, um, habit, um, authenticity. Um, yeah, just trying to negotiate that space where, you know, like I'm trying to cling on to something that maybe is like slowly slipping away. Um, I'm thirsty, so I'm going to like sip it. <laughs> I hope, yeah, I think that's the last image. So I think, yeah, are we going to go to the next artist? Is that cool? Yeah. Thank you, Zarina. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, no, thank you. So uh, like I had mentioned before, everybody, we will circle back at the end for a wider Q&A for everybody. Uh, and so the next artist that I have the pleasure of introducing is Paul Dignan. Paul Dignan is best for his hard-edged approach to abstract painting. This is evident in the early stripe-based paintings of the 1990s, all the way through to meticulously made geometric paintings of the present. Born in Dundee, Scotland, Dignan is a graduate of the Slade School of Fine Art London and Grace School of Art in Aberdeen, and has exhibited widely both nationally and internationally since the mid-1980s. His work has been included in exhibitions at the Center of Contemporary Art in Glasgow and the Art Gallery of Ontario, and has received various awards in both the UK and Canada, including the Rome Scholarship in Painting at the British School at Rome, as well as being the recipient of the Canada Council for the Arts ISCP New York Residency. He has lived and worked in Elmira, Ontario since 2003. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, thank you very, very much, Lucas. And uh, thank you, Zarina. That was um, so interesting. Um, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Ray, Lucas, Abby, and everybody at the AG uh, w for you know making this this happen, especially with you know what we're all going through at, at this time. Um, I sort of thought about the the notion of repetition and maybe wanted to talk about uh, you know I, ideas to do with how like my, my work is obviously at times like yep the, the repetition is there. you can see it. Um, visually, and um, this this first image, I'm actually going to go back to 1996, uh, and this is before I actually. This is from a show, a Scottish Arts Council touring exhibition, and this is from uh, uh, the, the, a time where, like, the, this is from a slide, so it's like it's been digitized, so it's not that good quality. But um, the idea of repetition. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of um, more than just making a mark or carrying out an action or repeating it. Um, the use of repetition for me, I've always been very sort of um, 
keen on setting parameters and boundaries with when, which I work, predetermined boundaries, which I sort of then gradually deconstruct. Um, repetition, we, we all kind of use it as a learning tool. It's, it's not only visual, it's like a, if you're learning a musical instrument, the way to learn it is keep doing it again and again, the same action. And it's the same with learning a new language. You, you know, it's through rote, it's through like repetition. Um, I'm kind of interested in like presenting something beyond what it maybe initially appears like. And as I said, this is like, this is quite a long time ago, but it's still like 10 years after I graduated. Um, I initially started off at art school. I was like very much like a sort of a neo figurative Julian Schnabel type messy artist. You know, I used everything and anything. And then I became more and more like restrictive. I needed more and more boundaries within which to control like what I wanted to do. And the, 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 that, that I found really, really important. Um, these two paintings, I made them, I made one of them uh, to the end of, you know, to, to its completion. They're, they're uh, 24 inches uh, square. Uh, they're acrylic on masonite. And I used masking tape uh, at that time. I didn't use any computers at that time either. Um, what I tried to do is I made the green one first and then I wrapped it up and covered it and I made the red one, tried to make it from memory, the, the green one. So it was effectively, um, I just changed the, the two colors that are involved in it and I tried to do it from memory. I tried to remember the width of the band widths that so they became like versions of each other or siblings, like they're different, but they're from the same root. Um, can you go to the next image, please, Abby? Um, this, this is just a bit further after that, a couple of years later. Um, again, like the idea, the, the, the previous ones, they, they, they did look a lot more uniform. And I was kind of, I've been very much an artist who at times can get bored of his, bored of making, making the work. And um, so I'm constantly looking to maybe reinvent like, or, or bring in a new rule or get, discard something where I, so I'm, I remain interested in making my own work. So this is the same size, like size can be a constraint. You know, this is like 24 inches square. Again, it's acrylic on uh, masonite. But what I wanted to do was actually give this the appearance of being very regular from a distance. And it, it was. This is like quite a good image of this, this piece, but it's, um, it's almost too good. I'd rather, have, I'd like to have shown an image when you're actually standing 20 feet away from it. It looks a lot more regular. But what I was interested in doing was like maybe sucking the viewer in, like inviting them to, to look at the work closer. Um, it's initially like the, the structure, if I seem to remember, like, because that's, that's also something that I think about. Like I'm, I'm not particularly, there's whole bodies of work where I actually can't remember what the schemata or the, the idea was behind them because like I made these rules and then like I get rid of them as like I, as the work progresses. But with these, there would be a basic division, like a regular division of maybe, I don't know, a couple of inches or something like that. And then like certain like parameters, the amount of colors, amount of tones or uh, shades or tints that are used um, so that when you, looking close, uh, like this is a close up now that uh, we're looking at, that you can actually see that there, there are differences there. But if you can go back one, Abby, like to the 
the, the, the previous image, that from a distance, it's going to look a lot more regular than, uh, than, than the close-up. So it's like a, it, it's, it's kind of inviting the viewer's eye in, but also ultimately as well, like rejecting a sort of a, a retinal approach where if you can go back forward, please, um, where there actually can be quite difficult to look at. Um, I don't know, there, there is an influence of like maybe op art there, but it's, um, yeah, those, those were things I was thinking about. Um, another, actually, the, the next image, thanks. Um, this is from, uh, again, from uh, 97, and I made this at the Triangle Workshop in uh, New York, uh, which is a, a wonderful residency program that's like still still running. They have permanent residency and they also do the workshop. And um, this is like, I think, four feet, uh, 48 inches by 48 inches, and it's acrylic on beach plywood. Um, again, I wanted that to have a, this this one to have more of a more of an appearance of regular or regularity. But again, on closer inspection, the, like the subtle differences, like the the actual sort of bright colors uh, within there, the, the, those would all be uh, similar to the previous slide, where there'd be slight sort of discrepancies. But the, the bandwidths, like the, the spacing, is uh, um, the same. But there's something as well that, again, like going back to this idea of repetition or suggestion of repetition is instead of like um, having that just vertical, like I, I, I started even going back to the first image, til tilting things and taking, not bothering where the edge was, like so the, 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 regu the regular uh, bandwidths, they would suggest a continuation beyond the edge but it's not contained within the actual uh, picture plane. So that was a, another, another thing, you know, I, if I could make those go on forever, then I, I would have, but you can't, do, you can't do that. So I wanted to suggest like, beyond, you know, continuation beyond the edge. Also, um, making more than one of these, like I'd, I'd done the, this, that previous one where I tried to make a version of another piece of work from memory. Well, I'd stop doing that. I'd actually maybe make four or five of these at the same time, where the only change would be uh, the, 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 like a color, a palette thing. But I, I wanted them to, to have their own identities. Like, so I would make, like, make a choice of one decision, like what makes the difference between them. Um, but also, like, the idea of, looking at doing something over and over again and changing things and reacting to them um, as part of a learning process. It was actually, it's re really important for me to actually know what I didn't want to do. And the only way of doing that was by actually doing a lot of the same thing and then finding out like, no, that, that doesn't work, but this does. And sort of looking for like maybe visual accidents to happen. In the case of this one, um, the accident was that I always like read this painting as being the, the, the blue shades in the middle, which are individual stripes. I think there's maybe 15 of them. This was incredibly, um, God, yeah, I'll be honest, like it was a tedious painting to make. I, I, I remember making it and it was... Um, it was it was a it was a labor. Um, I, th I think Zarina used the word habit. That's what that felt like making that like every day was I was I didn't at times didn't feel as if I was making any progress at all, but it was all about the end result and knowing where that would uh, lead. Um, so where was I with it? Oh yeah, the, the con I always read that. Is concave the blue the 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 thing? But there's other people that read it as convex, and that's completely 
fine with me. Those those blue sort of the, uh, the areas in between the, the the brighter bands. So it's like a perceptive thing. Um, I'm 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 totally open for those things to happen, and there's no sort of definite uh, like definite aspect saying that's the way it is. Um, the next next image. Uh, you know, I was using repetition as a, a visual strategy. Um, so the outcome could be, uh, then the outcome could be at times almost anticipated, but I wanted to actually do some other work where it wasn't anticipated, where it was, uh, where I, this is a grid format, where it's actually one drawing that's repeated number of, a number of times and then rotated and put up. I'm going to try and speed up because I'm cutting into Shramista's time here. I'm sorry. Uh, still adhering to, you know, working with set parameters, amount of colors being used. But basically, what there's there are 16 units in that painting, and it's actually based all based on one line drawing that I did in graph paper, scanned into a computer, and then like I would I would play around with it that way. And it's in effect, using like units to actually like a number of different things to for uh, the whole outcome. Um, uh, can you move go to the next one, please? Similar idea. There, there was a grid format to this. This was made. Uh, this is jumping way ahead to twenty thirteen. The previous one uh, was uh, twenty eleven. Uh, that's now in the art bank, uh, um, but th this particular one was uh, I made at ISCP in New York, um, and it's similar where it's a grid, um, where I deconstructed it, where the, 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 there was a re it was done, the, there was a lot of regular aspects to this, and then each day like I'd come in and work at it and try and work intuitively on that. Okay, next next image. Um, these shaped ones again, like to do with like uh, setting parameters. Like basically, they're the, the the only things that are different. The the bandwidths are the same. There's a tint shift, shape, airbrush effect, same effects. Like the, um, but I'm altering facets to make them different. The color, the amount of edges, um define where divisions might be drawn. Um, I wanted them to all have the appearance of being related, but different. If you can go on to the, the next image, that's an example from that series. So there's basically one color, uh, sorry, two colors, gray and green, and then tints off of that. Next image, please. This, the same there, the only difference is there's maybe one more edge on that. Okay, um, next image. And this is finally up to what I've been, the, 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 these are works. Uh, this one is not actually in, in the triennial, um, but it's, uh, it's again, going back to visiting, like suggesting repetition beyond the edge. Um, but I, I attempt to make them as regular, that, that this particular series is as regular as possible. Um, but I did, started making them on canvas, which gives it like, I think like there's more of a touch of an actual person um, when you go, you go in close to them. Um, you can just rotate through the rest. The, I think there's a couple of images more. That's from the same series. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, my... Uh... My power just same, or at least my lights just went out at the same time. This is all happening. Um, thank you, Paul, for taking us through that work. Um, the last artist that I had the pleasure of introducing is Sharmista Kar. Sharmista Kar is an art practice is an artist and art practitioner from India and is currently living and working in London, Ontario. She holds an MFA from Western University, focusing on hand embroidery. Kar's journey with hand embroidery started as a student in Calcutta, India and she has used that knowledge as a medium in her art practice from 2018 onward, along with drawing and painting. 
She has exhibited in India, UK, the USA, and Finland, and in Canada. Cara is one of the artists involved in Gardenship and State, which will open at Museum London in September 2021. Cara's studies began in West Bengal, India, and later pursued higher education in fine arts at the University of Hyderabad. She was awarded the prestigious Charles Wallace India Trust Award, the gold medal for first rank as an MFA at University of Hyderabad, and Dean and Chair's Entrance Scholarships at Western University, as well as the Graduate Thesis Research Award in 2018. Thank you, Sharmista. Um, thank you very much, Lucas, and uh, Ray, Abby, and the whole team of AGW um, for organizing and making me a small part of the whole exciting exhibitions. And, it's a pleasure to listen, Paul and Zarina, and it's, I mean, I'm just thrilled. <laughs> I, I miss that in person. So thank you for organizing this and having me here. Okay, um, um, thank you, Abby. Uh, so I kind of uh, try to bring just a um, few images where I can talk briefly and maybe a story that uh, how I came into this whole idea of uh, mobility and migration, memory, and how I can try to relate with those experiences uh, from a very personal perspective. And I wanted to again acknowledge the part that I don't understand or I miss or I couldn't connect uh, with the place and people that I live uh, in different time. So a small brief history for me living in different place uh, due to my father's profession. We lived in many different uh, places in India and in the city or the province that I grew up. And we kind of had this uh, connecting and disconnecting or this attachment, detachment, all these binary feelings that I grew up with uh, since my childhood. So this uh, first piece that I'm uh, having here is an um, image where I, I first noticed these blue tents in the city that I was living in um, Hyderabad. And those blue color were kind of uh, striking in my eyes because that is like a fast growing city in terms of um, like it's a hub for software engineers and all. So I was thinking of these people who come to this construction site, lives there and then move after a few months and then again another new site and maybe they do not even go back to their uh, village or the city they come from. And then I started connecting with me and my experience and I felt like I need to acknowledge this part of the culture that I am growing uh, or living at that time. Uh, and this uh, this outside frame I took uh, from Mughal miniature from 16th century. And those are basically used for uh, from portraiture and uh, for illustrated manuscript um, at that time. So I kind of uh, tried to blend and maybe put uh, some importance to those people uh, by showing the place that they were leaving, not just putting their portrait itself. And uh, that's how this series came in 2014. And then it, you can see later how this whole, the idea of tent and my experience of living in different places kind of came uh, eventually. Uh, next image, please, yeah. Thank you. So this is from that same series. You can see the, the construction behind those blue tents. And I was also living in at an apartment and we basically I took all these photos by standing in my balcony and then um, stitched them and drew. So this blurred image actually is the kind of verso side of it. So this recto and verso is one of the part that I use in my practice to show the front and the back and which helps me to express my experience of unknown or and the known. So this is the back of it. And it's like a veiled blurred image, which helps me to kind of express that unknown part of the experience of knowing these people's experience. 
yeah we can go to the next one okay uh this is one of the <laughs> very uh, important piece for me um and this work and the idea came uh, when i was uh, studying at western and uh, the whole idea of embroidery craft and uh, like um, we all know uh, that thinking through craft by glenn adamson and he mentioned that craft is like a habit of action and we all were talking about today habit and i feel like that's a very important uh, um, phrase that um, I love from his text. And so this work actually um, came with the idea uh, of kind of understanding the inevitable action of cutting a thread during embroidery. And I kind of um, tried to see uh, a piece where I do not cut the thread and stitch as long as I could. So this is a small um, yarn that I got. It is around 300 meter long and I dyed it in natural dye and then I tried to make a form out of it without cutting. So that was a very, very different experience for me where it's, it's a feeling that I feel like um, that I, I, I'm comfortable. At the same time, I'm, I am thinking a lot of thing which is associated with this particular act or the skill. And that helped me uh, the particular craft or the embroidery called Banka Sishu from uh, Japan. And it's also not a very old technique, it's only 1920s. Um, so, so this is done with Banka. And I, I use the same technique uh, in my current practice a lot, along with other embroidery um, uh, styles or form. But Banka helps me to represent the, this fragile or incomplete experience of living in a new place and knowing or experience, uh, experience the current uh, living of my time. So yeah, we can go to the next one. Okay, um, so this is um, a uh, from a series again called uh, Soft Shelter, where I, I am acknowledging this um, tent and I feel it's a very important structure uh, for me um, to represent this temporary living and uh, a lot of things. And I, I just do not want to connect with the refugee experience, but it can happen with anybody leaving and just even there in the same country or same city. So I, I use tent from a very optimistic uh, way as well. I feel like um, it has a lot of association with different experiences, but I wanted to see it in a place where um, optimism grows and people live with hope and uh, for a better future maybe and, and that's how this uh, whole uh, series I'm working on still and I call it soft shelter. So here I kind of use this um, a parallelogram which basically represent one side of a tent the roof and I went on repeating the form on this and I went I, I worked maybe more than one and a half months to do that. And I felt uh, repetition definitely teaches a lot. It helps to learn. But um, I wanted to question like, when we go on repeating, does it uh, get into that saturation point where it doesn't affect anymore? And sometimes we write things, we keep a foot in front of our, our eyes but at some point we start tending overlooking uh, the image so my question was like when i repeat does it lose its importance but i don't know the answer but i feel like uh, how how does it feel to a viewer or maybe to me when i'm creating so that was one of the idea behind making all this uh, form repeatedly in one place um, okay, yeah, and this is again, it's more um, in number and the composition I changed a bit and then again, um, 
using tarp was another idea where I wanted to see the embroidery, which is very domestic and used in a soft material, a very sometimes very size oriented, uh, very personal, uh, which I'm trans or using it on tarp, which is industrially made, but uh, meant for outdoor mostly. But again, when I see the history of tent and uh, tarp, uh, I see it's like, since it's humanity existed, tent is there through animal skin, then cotton, then different material. So the association and the existence is there or was there. So I didn't, um, I, I definitely acknowledge that part, but here it was more like very personal to the, the material, which is very industrially used and made. So that kind of contrast also was another uh, aspect that I wanted to experience in this work. You can go to the next one. Yeah, and this piece, uh, again, from that same uh, series called Soft Shelter. And here you can see one side and the other back where I leave a long thread, just um, again, it's, I wanted to leave the kind of a leftover uh, connection or um, that I just don't want to complete or put a full stop to that particular experience or which I cannot even uh, know it totally. So that that's why I, I left always a uh, little bit string behind uh, on the other side of the embroidery. So this is the um, part uh, of the uh, other half of this work. And I, I, I kind of like that because it shows one side is very concrete, solid, complete image and the other half is kind of fragile because if you pull one string, it will come off. And it's, I do not fix it. I do not put any glue where people do that uh, to make it um, solid. But I try to leave it like that. And I try to be more gentle in terms of handling and, and keeping it. So yeah, that's uh, kind of, uh, yeah. So this was another work where hmm, I, I, wanted a viewer to experience this uh, fragility or uh, this particular medium banka, how delicate it is. And even I had to be very careful when I work it by myself because sometimes um, it touches something and it comes up and I go back again and I work on it. So I wanted to, uh, give that similar uh, experience to the viewer and what they might feel. So it's like uh, I made a small piece and I put it on top of a light box and, uh, and yeah, you can see this small, it's a very, very small video where people are basically pulling it off and um, they are going through different experiences. Like, uh, so, that that exchange of that particular experience is very tough and i felt like i can only do that through this project and it's a small work and you can Keep do going. something with it when's it gonna stop <laughs> you've just stop. undone all the work <laughs> so that's just yeah that's jamil felt that it's um uh, she did uh, undone my work, but I felt it's 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 for me definitely. I mean, visually it might look it's undone, but for me it's another part of my work where I stopped and the viewer uh, continued. And another idea was there that uh, I wanted to see this my experience of making this tent and how it travels uh, from my studio to gallery, gallery to those people who collected the small piece of thread to their homes. It's like an invisible mapping happening. And I, I was planning to do this piece here and just to get a documentation maybe from where these people are coming or even their facial expression and when they're pulling it up and what they feel like when they're basically undone uh, an artist's work or 
this fragile kind of an experience and uh, their reactions. So anyway, maybe we'll have it sometimes. So this is uh, one piece. And um, this, uh, I'm working again in the same similar series where I'm embroidering lots of uh, tent in a very sim minimalistic approach. And this is on rice paper where again, I choose rice paper. It's just because uh, I thought that it's also an ancient medium if we see the history of paper as fabric uh, and then uh, again, repeating on it. And it, I related with the fiber that which is exist in fabric as well as in the paper. And this rice paper definitely has that uh, fiber quality. Even though it's very fragile, I needed to be extra careful. But I kind of liked one part of it that uh, when I put it against light, I see the other half of it as well as the wrong piercing of my needle, which might look like star or something. So it gives a very, uh, very different atmosphere when we see it. So this is like normal view and the next image would be against light. So you can, yeah, those dots are not very clearly visible here, but it's it's visible and it's different in terms of visual uh, representation. So you can see all this journey. And one of the reason was for me to come into embroidery is to show this other half or the journey, which I was missing in my uh, realistic painting. I was, I, yeah, I trained as a realistic painter, but, uh, but embroidery helped me uh, conceptually expressing what I'm thinking and wanted to share. And to the next image. Ooh, okay. Um, this image actually is very, for me also, it was difficult to take the photograph because it's white on white. And then I embroidered uh, with the silver thread around the tent. So this is, uh, I think the tabernacle, the title of the work is Tabernacle and Hope. Um, I like my, I come from a family where uh, my great grandfather was a farmer and we still have a lot of paddy fields in India. So I, I was thinking of that part from where I come from and then uh, the hope which is associated with the tent and I wanted to focus on that optimistic area. So I was thinking of this, all the people uh, who, who travels, who migrate, who move from one place to other with a lot of hope that consistently exist in their memory or experience that a home back and home where they live in. So I, I kind of overlapped to tent and the part overlapped I made with the green color of thread and just to uh, give a suggestion of sprouting like uh, when before farming the paddy field we, 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 we put the seed in one place and they just grow and then we took in a bunch and go to a particular part of the field to pl plant them sequentially or in a certain group. So I wanted to show that growth of this to home and the hope in this work. And we can go to the next, okay. And this is my uh, last image for today's presentation. And uh, I did this last year in, and I kind of, again, um, draw this image of a river and all, yeah, and all of, yeah, some of my work has a lot of map-like image, like it might look like cartographic map, but none of them uh, represents any particular cartographic map, but it's um, when I traveled and saw the image and I kind of remember again and uh, I try to do that. I don't even draw them. I just go on the fabric with the st stitching. And this was um, the river Thames or the Antler River in London. Uh, I walk uh, most of the time and I felt um, this work um, doing it last year. Uh, and I kind of, I see the riverside throughout the year 
when the tree grows and then the fall comes again like now it's again growing the green is back slowly so i wanted to acknowledge that and uh the life around the river along with the people who come with different ex expectations for future and i kind of represents those people around the river and uh, with those um, um parallelogram and like, river again is a part of humanity from ancient time and um I see the nature again, I mean, as a uh, personhood, I mean, these are the ideas behind this particular piece. And there are a lot of uh, activities going on to, for the well-being of uh, the river uh, Thames or the Antler River. Here, you know, Tom Cull, he's like one of the big figure who is working for the um so yeah that's all for today <laughs> thank you Sharmista. Thank you. and uh thank you again paul and zarina uh for going through your work and sharing that with us it's nice to uh kind of see some of the work and talk about the backstory uh as we get ready to go into the show we have a couple minutes left for questions. So if anybody's watching has some questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. We do have a couple of them ready and loaded. The first one for Zarina. Okay. Uh, how do, you, <laughs> I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. How do storytelling and community play into your work? Um, this is coming from Jude, who's thinking about this from a cultural legacy slash uh, preservation of identity perspective. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jude. Thanks for coming too. Um, yeah, you know, what's funny, I thought about community, and I feel like my work is actually more so about the lack of community, because it's so insular, like, it's just me trying to figure out that space. Um, more so like mentally, but um, now that I'm revisiting these things that I'm kind of mentally wrestling with, um, I have even turn to food and food culture more and how that type of community is like based around placemaking. Um, so that's super important to me now. Um, and then storytelling. Uh, yeah, I mean, like it's, it's quite personal. I feel like where these, especially with working from memory as most of us have kind of touched on too, is just like they're, they're very rich in kind of visceral sensations that like, you know, that's informing your work. Um, and it's not, it's not obvious to the viewer, but you could tell that's coming from a very sentimental place and you're trying to like use your hands or use whatever medium you're using to kind of work through that. And so maybe it's not obvious to the viewer, but like, as you're trying to understand like what this piece means to me I means to you I feel like that's something that's like always a, a return like that's always like your foundation so that's kind of how storytelling is helpful for me um and I find with with storytelling sorry I'll be like super quick but like like using the type of materials that I am interested in are kind of creating that distance so it's a little bit more universal for other people to understand as well like for that interpretation to just like go wherever it wants to but for what it is for me like that's okay if someone doesn't understand it like that's my own personal story so I don't get kind of like butt hurt if someone like <laughs> doesn't get it <laughs> um yeah hopefully I hope I answered that <laughs> um we have another question from Jude for Sharmista um which is what does unraveling mean to you in your work um, again, coming from a place of thinking about identity politics and preservation of culture. Um, unraveling, maybe, because there maybe this question comes for me where I address the gap between the neuro memory and the social memory, because I just feel like I'm always missing something. And that's how maybe um, this uh, whole idea of uh, recto verso comes and uh, where I wanted to acknowledge that unraveling maybe 
uh, happens partially, but it doesn't really uh, happen in a complete sense. And I always wanted to acknowledge uh, that part in my work for years because uh, I kind of don't like the dot, but lots of dot which continues. And uh, that helps me to grow, know more, learn more and uh, share as well. Like uh, I'm constantly living in different places and this meeting and learning helps. And that's so maybe it unravels as well per partly and then it adds into it too. So yeah, I don't know, maybe it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we have one last question from Derek. This is going to be an open question to uh, anyone who wants to answer. Um, but they're curious to know if anyone could speak to the way that their relationships with others and memories of others, family, extended kin, how that comes into their artistic practice. Is there anyone to start? Or? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Derek. Um, yeah. Uh, oof. I think especially with kinship and taking care of elderly and like the importance of that within someone's culture, I think like there is a little bit of anxiety of this familial expectation to take care of that. So not only is it like a life that you're kind of understanding has an expiry, but it's just like the legacy of that and understanding like what that meant within movement and migration and settlement. Um, just like reading the thing again, I'm trying to remember what they're asking. Uh, yeah, so like it weighs like very heavily on me. Um, I think there's like a good run of like Catholic guilt in there too, where it's just like, there's, you know, it's deep in you to fulfill something um, and make sure that you're respecting someone's position too. Um, and yeah, like the mem memories and like those tactile experiences like run super deep with um, how I work with whatever medium. Yeah, I'll keep it short. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, <clears throat> I kind of, um, I just mentioned that how memory works for me and um, it's mo mostly cultural memory, but again, when I am in a different place and then trying to remember or fetch some sort of inspiration, it, it, it creates question in me first that um, am I kind of uh, really remembering what happened or what I experienced and there I kind of, and then again, um, reflecting that experience into the work or the image, uh, I feel there is always a gap. And uh, again, there my medium helps me to express that that lack or gap. And I, I, I don't want to feel that gap, even if I don't understand, but for me, that's maybe the time or the experience that I'm moving and it's there in a different land or time. Um, then, but I wanted to acknowledge absolutely the, the role of memory and, and its, its influence into my current uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, I think it's slightly, my relationship with, with that is maybe slightly different. Um, I do think I actually like, find myself my mind wandering thinking about family can whatever when I'm actually making something that involves like a repetitive like kind of boring task where I don't actually need to concentrate on making decisions like I'm actually it, it's going through something in order to get it, it's a means to an end and that's when I start thinking about like 30 years ago when I lived the other side of the world and, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's maybe, it's maybe kind of different. You, you won't see it in the work, but it is, it, it's a huge part of that. The day when you're actually in the studio working is actually thinking, you know, about like family and friends that are near and far, especially during the, you know, 
even more so in the times that we're, we're living. Yeah. yeah, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna chime in quick. Um, saying Catholic guilt, I just wanna say that's like a product of like colonial sort of product. Um, so like that kind of intergenerational um, relationship just like runs through with like both memory and what certain relationships with relatives are coming through are also a reflection of like um, the economy, especially within central Alberta with um, the migrant migrant workers as well. So yeah, the whole Catholic thing, I was just like, it runs deep in like a different way, not specifically religiously. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And uh, thank you everybody for submitting your questions. I think with that, I will hand it back off to uh, Abby Lee. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. This I just felt like I was sitting in on a masterclass with all of you tonight. So thank you so much for sharing your, your practices, your insights, and, and your time. Really appreciate having you all here. For the folks who are here, if you had any questions that, you know, you're like, oh, we ran out of time. I'm dropping my email in the chat. So please feel free to check in with me. And uh, if you have any other questions um, going forward, I'm going to share my screen uh, just one last time here uh, as there uh, are a couple of more talks that are happening. So if you like, oh, I want to keep going to these talks, fear not, we have three more going on. So there we go, you can see here. Um, there we go. So on Thursday, May 6th, we have History of Objects, um, and Thursday, May 20th, Text and Space Speaking to Your Audience, and Thursday, June 3rd, Extending Media. These are all at 7 p.m., and you can feel free to register for those at agw.ca if you are interested, because we'd love to have you back. Um, but if uh, this is kind of where we part, I hope that you have a lovely rest of your evening. And thank you again so much for joining us tonight. And yeah, again, hopefully we will see you soon, though. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. -bye. Goodbye.